Hey, I'm Brady Calhoun. I'm with News 13. We've got uh, Superintendent Bill Husfeld here with us today. Uh, we're talking about some, some issues that are going on with this school system. Bill, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I, I, I'd rather say questions more than issues because sure. they're, they're not as issues as they look like. But that's why you're going to ask me. Well, yeah. We wanted to, you know, we, um, we did a story recently about an audit. You mm -hmm. guys have a, like a, uh, everybody uh, that sort of... Uh, Work, not works for the state, but every sort of state agency gets an yes. audit from the Auditor General's office. Mm -hmm. So we took a look at that this week. Right. Um, looked at some of the, um, you know, if I can't say issues is my go-to word, but looked right. at the things they highlighted. We asked you guys they, about they it. They technically call them findings. Findings. Okay, right. there you go. Yeah. Um, so, well, well, let's talk about it. Just kind of tell people what, what it is. Uh, you know, because it's not people hear audit and they immediately think finances, and that's not what this was. Well, there's there's two different kind of audits that we have every year. And in fact, the irony of it is the auditors stay. We have offices for them in our building because basically it takes them all year long to do one audit. Mm -hmm. There's a finance audit, and then there's a, a, a capital expenditures audit or everything else other than finance. And this is what the audit you're talking about right, right now. We're getting ready to have the exit on the finance audit. So, I mean, it, it, it is constant and ongoing. And the audit you're speaking of uh, address things other than finance. And, mm -hmm. and what they do is when they come up with findings, they say, look, we think this should have been done this way. You tell us why you did it this way or get another agency to tell us mm -hmm. why you needed to do it this way. That, that kind of thing. Yeah. One of, the, one of the findings they had had to do with, you know, contractors, mm -hmm. contractor spending. I think because of the hurricane, things were perhaps done differently. Um, so, I mean, to start with, is, is the district monitoring its contractors appropriately? Yeah, this yeah. was, uh, Brady, and if anybody reads the whole thing, they'll mm -hmm. understand. This was all immediately after the hurricane. There were six companies that we had that did the remediation after the hurricane. What that meant was they went in and took out all the damaged, wet material. They dried everything in, put temporary roofs on things, got rid of all the debris, cut the trees. I mean, they did everything before we could even start talking about using any of the facilities again. Yeah, you have to remember what Bay County looked like. Yes, in Michael, yes. Right? And so people are looking at that and not realizing that's what it's talking about. In our usual bidding process, what we do is if we give a we give a contract to a company, then they have to be bonded, and there's a, a bonding agency won't give you a bond unless they know the scope of the work they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Well, in these emergency-type situations, you can't do that. So if anybody would want to or, or has the ability to go back and read the emergency order that the governor implemented, it said that political agencies uh, could go and bypass those processes because they knew you didn't have time to seek bonds for work that you couldn't even tell how much it was going to be. And so in during all that time, uh, our attorney felt, and we all felt, we were part of the political process. Uh, we are just like the cities and nobody the county told you government. You weren't. Nobody the told us the we governor's weren't. office yeah. didn't say. No, we. This I applies mean, to everybody but school districts, yes. right? And so, in fact, we're still disagreeing with that and arguing with that. But what what we found out, and I, I never in my wildest dreams would uh, believe this, but they, the uh, auditors think we're under home rule, and what that means is we get to make our own rules up. So, so. Uh, what they're telling us now is we need a rule in our policy that just says we that says that just states that we can do this in emergency situations without anybody's approval. Well, now that sounds worse than what we actually did, and so it's you know, and I know people want to twist because it's 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 glorified when you twist it and make it sound worse than it is. But it's six companies. I mean, every one of us were scrambling to try to put the pieces back together after the hurricane. This is exactly what happened. And so well, in our normal processes, we do bond everybody. Yeah, sure. But I mean, ultimately, when you guys look back at what was spent, did you say to yourselves, we spent too much no. on this, this contractor um, paid we for We spent a well, lot. You know, yeah. I mean, but you, you, didn't, you didn't spend for things that didn't get done. No. You didn't, no, nothing was done. Um, you know, school board member's house, the trees didn't suddenly no. disappear from. No. You know what I mean? Is no. I think that's the thing that people, and, given and the climate we're in, and that's you're right. the thing people are concerned about. And you're right, but that's why I'm here to, to clarify. Mm -hmm. You are exactly right. But if they'd have found any of that, they would have said something, and I know that they would have highlighted that. They didn't take exception with any of the amounts we 
spent. What right. they took exception was, and again, you need to go back and read the finding, was that we didn't bond it. Okay. Because they thought we should have bonded it. And there was no ex look. There was there was an unreal amount of money that was spent on remediation. I mean, mm -hmm. it was just crazy, and and all of us did it. I mean, the counties, the cities, we didn't have any choice. It wasn't like we could say, okay, we're going to advertise for 30 days to find somebody to do this work. Right. And we spent crazy money. I mean, it was. Uh, you you almost want to go back and say, oh, I need to do this for a living as much as these guys are making. But it was it's standard across that industry in these emergency yeah. situations, and, and we were paying the standard rate that everybody else was paying. We well, and any homeowner any who, who hired somebody to come come do that, I mean, my insurance company paid, paid at my house, and I was shocked, you know, for mm -hmm. what they did versus what my insurance company paid. But, well, and, you know, and what are you going to do? Well, yeah. and, uh, you know, eventually I know we'll get around to FEMA, but uh, I just finished my last month, I just finalized my last part of the insurance claim for the hurricane on my personal house. So, I mean, you know, that's two plus mm -hmm. years. And I feel blessed because there's so many people out there still arguing with their insurance companies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another issue, uh, another uh, finding. Um, yes, Had finding. to do with finding. Had to do with uh, medical insurance, uh, you know, and it had to do, they sort of, uh, the way they phrased it had to do with, are these people who are identified as family members actually family members of the employee? They want us to go back and verify that if you work for us and you say these are your children, that they're your children. Are you not already verifying that? Well, they, they they tell us they are. They sign the papers and say they and are. They say and say so they've committed a crime if they're lying to you. Right? And so we have a company that we pay that does all our insurance and, and monitors these things. So in the new contract, we're adding that in the new contract. Now, they found no one in, in their audit that had claimed this that didn't legitimately have it. They're just looking at the possibility this could happen. And they do this with something else, too, later, but they're just saying, okay, you need this to make sure this doesn't happen. They're not finding anything happen. They're just saying, look, we really think you need to add something to prevent that from happening, an abuse of someone being covered that should not be covered. Yeah, and, and I don't want to go through the, through the audit point by point, but there were a couple of issues like that, I think, that had mm -hmm. to do... There was an issue with purchasing cards. There were an issue. Yeah, with, and know. again, they found nothing was wrong with any of the purchasing cards. And, and, and here's what happens. If you have, if, uh, and, and we have people retire mid-year, and then the purchasing cards stay in the safe at the schools. That's where they stay. Mm -hmm. But those, what they're saying is those cards should have been sent to the, uh, the purchasing department and destroyed. And so we've got to come up with a process to do that. There were, again, there was no one spent anything or used those cards after they were terminated. But they just said you need a process to get rid of them quicker than what you normally do. That was it. Okay. Was there anybody who was retrained or suspended or fired as a result of no. the findings in the audit? No. And, and, and the, the, the irony of it is these findings were, most of them were just typical things that they do every year and they find every year. And let me give you an example. Uh, this isn't typical, but this was a new law. There's a new law that by July 1st we have to post our expense report, or I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but our expense Your report. Financial yeah, our financial Yes, our financial report. Well, we can't do that until we get the documentation that the state has to send us so that we can fill in the blanks that the state has. Well, the state didn't send them to us until after July 1. So we got written up for something that we have absolutely no control over, and, and the auditors know that. In fact, I talked to one of the chief auditors in Tallahassee today because we were talking about uh, some of these other things. And he said, yeah, we really feel bad about that, but the law says you're supposed to do it here. So they don't care what the reason is you didn't do it. Even though Tallahassee didn't give it to you, they're still going to write you up for it. I mean, that's, that's the world we live in. It's a, not a lot of give there, huh? Nope. Not a lot of bend. Nope. Um, you know, I, anyway, I, ultimately, I, that's what I was looking for. Ultimately, there's no, um, there's no penalty. I mean, you got, you know, the find, I think they had 10 findings or whatever it was. They could have had 20 or 30 or 50 findings. Regardless, there's no, like, 
uh, penalty associated with it. There's no fine. There's no. no now, if there had been some malfeasance or something illegal mm -hmm. or something unethical, there would have been, and they would have reported that. And one of the things they always ask you is, do you, are you aware of anything illegal or unethical or anything that we need to be concerned of that would be an illegal action? And, and, and we said no. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and look, they're very aware of the documents that we've had subpoenaed. They, yeah. I mean, the, the whole public is aware of that. I mean, there's been there's been businesses and doctors' offices in Bay County that have had their records subpoenaed, sure. uh, and that doesn't mean you're guilty of anything. We we cooperate with everybody, even these auditors. They got everything they asked for. Their reports are are very articulate in what they found. It's just that some people confuse. They immediately see they had six contractors that they should. Well, that's not what it says. It says we had six contractors that weren't bonded. And there was no way to bond anybody at that time after the hurricane. And so people get confused and frustrated, and so I appreciate the opportunity to clarify it. Sure. Uh, one of the, you know, the big thing that's going on with the school district right now is that you guys are, um, you're seeking a millage rate increase, a tax increase. Mm -hmm. uh, you're seeking to, for the public to vote on it. Yep. And, and if I get any of this wrong, you just jump in and okay. tell me. But it's going basically up, if it's approved by the voters, it would go up by one mil. Um, hundred dollars per a uh, hundred dollars per a hundred thousand dollar piece of property. Okay, and um, that's going to be uh, voted on in April. Is April twentieth. Right? April twentieth. Okay, so let's. I mean, let's just go through this. Why? Um, why do you? Why does the district seeking this military increase? Well, there's two main points to this. One is uh, the voters will vote for it. The school board does not have the authority, like cities or the county, to just raise millage as they think it needs to be raised. Our millage is its set by the state, basically. We don't have any choice. I mean, we have very little leeway for operations. The, the state tells us exactly what it needs to be, and then the board just basically rubber stamps it. Since 2008, and I'll tell you in a minute why I'm using 2008, but since 2008, our base student allocation has gone up 3.7 percent, and and so I mean th that's you, the cost of living has gone up much more than that since 2008. I, I I challenge anybody to look and ask them how much they paid for a doctor's visit in 2008, how much they pay for it now, how much they paid for a haircut in 2008, pay for it now. I mean cable bill. Mm -hmm. I mean give me a break. Yeah, and you're talking when you say student allocation, you're talking about. The state sends you guys money based on how many base, students you have. There's a base student allocation And, and since formula. 2008, it's only gone up 3%. You're going to have to pardon me a minute. I'm going to give right. you the exact number. Go ahead. Um, oh, we're getting serious now. You pulled out your glasses. Yeah, yeah. I thought I had the exact number, but it is exactly 3.7% since 2008. And that's the base student allocation is what we operate on. Now, let me tell you why I use 2008. 2008 was when everybody totally agreed, yeah, we, we just went through a recession and we're still in a recession. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I mean, we, everything in the state was going pretty good until then. I mean, uh, our rates, our, our, our funding from the state was pretty steady and everything, and then it started going down. And then so you would think it would, it would start to go back up between mm -hmm. 2008 and now, even right before the pandemic, but what's happened is it hasn't. It's been very stagnant. Again, 3.7% uh, since 2008, the base student funding. And, and I, I know this is heartburn with a lot of people, Sure. but, um, you know, we pay our bus drivers, uh, incoming bus drivers, I think 12.37 an hour, our new bus drivers. Mm -hmm. Well, they can go and fry chicken for 18 to $22 an hour. Uh, and, and we can't we can't find enough employees to do the job that everyone wants them to do. And our teachers, the salaries for our teachers, uh, have have been very stagnant What's over the years. What's the starting teacher make right now? Right now, it's forty uh, forty seven thousand. A starting teacher uh, makes forty. No, forty seven thousand was the goal of the state. We got it up to forty four five. Okay. Uh, you know, we would love to keep getting it up. The governor mm -hmm. gave us some more funding to get it up, but our goal is to not only get the beginning teacher salaries up, but all salaries. Yeah. And, and we're not just talking about teachers. We're talking about paraprofessionals. We're talking about bus drivers, custodians. I mean, what we you, believe when, all of them when deserve you're, more. When you're hiring people mm -hmm. and you're trying to hire Hot people, trying to hire. What, what's the problem you're seeing? Because I've done this story a couple of times, and I've talked to folks, and it seems like housing is the number one issue. You hire somebody from out of the area at, in the 40s now, which is, which is, I mean, I think you'd agree that's, 
that's a good starting salary for Bay County. Mm -hmm. And uh, but are, are they? What are you hearing from them when they come back? Are they, they can't find a place to live. Well, if if, if they're professional, they're going to make more than forty, and mm -hmm. so our bus drivers don't make anywhere near that. But uh, the housing is a major issue. In fact, I was at a presentation recently at the county uh, a county presentation. Um, and I think the starting starting round for houses now are in the the early 200s, 220, 225, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so the people that need to fill these jobs that we have, they can't they they can't make it on the salaries that we're able to pay and them. They can't and afford the no. rent or the or and, to and buy a house. We lost, and and I know you know this, Brady. And I think most of the people who are listening to this or watching this will know this, but we lost 25 percent of our Title I population on this side of the bridge immediately after the hurricane. And it was because of housing. And that housing hasn't come back yet. Now, it's slowly coming back. Um, the, the I lived in rural arms garden apartments growing up. Mm -hmm. They still haven't opened back up. Mm -hmm. uh, Massalina Project, they've just flattened that. And I know they've got plans. The uh, Bob Sykes Drive housing project across mm -hmm. from the county center, it's it's flat dirt. I mean, the the, the house, the affordable housing and the housing projects have not caught up with what we need to have people come and work and live in Bay County at at that kind of salary. So where would the salary go if you if the voters approved the millage increase? See, this what is would a, bus drivers make. What this is a trick make? question because well, I'm not that. well. Yeah, I'm <laughs> not going to violate collective bargaining because yeah. I have two unions to deal with. So it it cost one million dollars to increase teacher salaries 1%. How much will you bring in? How much will the district bring $18 in? $18 million dollars if, the, if the millage uh, referendum passes. So all that has to be bargained, mm -hmm. and I can't say how much it's going to be, except our goal would be to increase everybody's salary. And the other part of this is it's just not, it's just not the public non-charter. It's charters, too. Mm -hmm. All this money, and this is by law, so it's not a trick or anything. All this money would go equally to where the students are. So if 15% of the students are in charter schools, they would get 15% of that millage. The money follows the students. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Right. And there are some other parts of that. It's just not about salaries. It's also about school safety. It's also about pre-K, and it's also about the mental mental health programs that we've got in place. We're getting there. Don't we, we're, I just I, I, there. I, I don't want people just to yeah. get hung up on $18 million. You're going to give everybody a 18% rate. That's nowhere near what we well, and obviously, do. Well, and I mean, I, I understand that you're uh, – Hamstrung uh, by the by the union a little bit, and you can't talk about well. If we got 18 million, the teachers would get a five percent raise or whatever. You just can't say that. But you I would say five percent would be the lowest. Okay. I mean, I, I, I we're talking about a significant raise. I mean, here's here's something that that I would love for Bay County to be known as paying their teachers the best of anybody anywhere near here. How comparable are we to other counties? We're below here? many other counties and there are four other counties near us that have this millage. Mm -hmm. Uh and 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 we're When you say below, below, how below are you talking about? I mean a thousand, maybe a little bit less than that, but I mean if you want to get the best teachers and here's here's the challenge we've got. Each year our average age of our teachers increases. Now, we'd like to get to a thing where it's uh, a point where it evens off, but we're not getting young teachers coming in. We're not getting college graduates coming into education because they can walk out of college and make a heck of a lot more on their first job than what they can make in a teacher's salary. And so mm -hmm. we've got to rectify that, and we've got to attract young uh, college graduates to come to education as a career, and, and we're going to hurt ourselves if we don't do that. And so we're going to... We're going to pay the price for that eventually down the road if we don't do something about it. Um, why, um, why now? You know, and and it's specifically why in April as opposed to November of this year, or even um, you know November of next year. Why why did the district um, do do this right this second? Well, we've been talking about trying to give teacher salaries. One thing is right now, as I said earlier, the beginning teacher salary got a big bump this year from the state. That money came directly for those teachers to bring everybody up as high as they could, and it brought the bottom salary to 44 5 mm -hmm. But no other employee got any raise. None of that money could be used for any of them. So that's one reason why then. 
Do you have starting learning. teachers now making more than five-year teachers? Or no, because we have moved everybody up, quitting that now. That, and, and that's the that's the angst that a lot of them have mm -hmm. is, wait a minute, I'm, they're making as much as me now. Uh, no yeah. one's making below that, but they're, they might be making the same, and they've got five years' experience on them. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, a point of contention with a lot of people. People, uh, you know, teachers work so hard and so regular they don't pay attention to what the law's doing, what the mm -hmm. governor's doing. They just they deal with what they yeah. have to do on a daily basis. So they thought many of them thought it was our decision to do that. We had mm -hmm. nothing to do with that. We had to follow the law and, and, and we did and we implemented it the way it was. So that's one reason why now. Uh, here here's what I would say to somebody said this is not the right time. Well mm -hmm. tell me when the right time is. Tell me when the right time is that everybody's going to agree that a tax increase is good and we'll change it and put it on there and expect 100% vote on it. There's never a right time for a tax increase. I understand that. I don't like taxes any more than anyone else. But we're going to get what we pay for, and if we don't start paying our teachers and our people and education and the business of what we're asking them to do more, we're going to lose them, and we're going to, we're going to keep losing them, and then that's not going to be a pretty sight. The other reason about the ballot is because if we want that to go into the next millage cycle, the next tax cycle, it has to be done kind of early. You can't all of a sudden do it in November and kick it off in January and the tax notices have already gone out for that year. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of moving pieces that go in with that. And there are some elections in April. So we piggybacked on some mm -hmm. of those elections that were going on. That's the answer. Okay. Um, Did we, I catch we, you at a speechless no, we, moment? No, you know, we caught, we, I'm going through my list of questions, and you, you've you answered about five of them in, you know, a couple of answers. So, of course, I'm running down my list going, what do I ask Bill next? What, what, are, we, what are we supposed to ask the superintendent? Um, so, among the concerns, uh, you know, that we've heard from the critics uh, who, you know, are concerned about a tax increase is that uh, has to do with staffing, and it has to do with how many staff members who aren't teachers the district is paying, essentially folks who are not in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I saw some comparisons floating around, but, you know, I, I wasn't able to nail down the numbers before we started this. But, you know, is, is the district, does the district have, um, is it top heavy? Does it have, you know, people that, that you're paying that aren't in the classroom and would that money be better spent either on more teachers or on raises in some way? And I, and I know what point you're referencing and here's the, here's the thing that you know people love to use the data they have mm -hmm. and the data they can get but they don't necessarily dig down into the data here's the bottom line we've got about 90 people right now that are paid for out of grant funding for just mental health mm -hmm. it doesn't come off of operations it would not be tied into any of that so you would say we're top heavy if that's just what you looked at but these, these people were in the schools dealing with the students and the trauma they were having before the pandemic about the hurricane. It was a huge grant we wrote, and those 90 people were paid out of that. So if you looked at just that one thing, you'd say that they're top-heavy. Mm -hmm. Another thing is we've written other grants and have Title I funding that a lot of other districts don't have that, uh, that we do have other personnel to help. We have parent liaisons in every school. We have uh, counselors, uh, military liaisons. We have all kinds of other positions that are funded through grant funding, not the operations where this millage would go to. And so if you just looked at it, tried to compare the two, you would think we were top heavy. Well, actually, we get more funding to do those programs because we have twice or three times as many Title I students as some districts near us. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean... Yeah, Bay County is not Walton County, it's not Okaloosa County when it comes no, to... I mean, comparing us to Okaloosa County is like comparing... i got to be careful about this, but, <laughs> you know, some hamburger joints to other hamburger joints. Well, the students in Bay County are, I mean, because I know this because I've done the stories, the students in Bay County are poorer um, and, and perhaps face more challenges because of the amount of money their parents make than students in Walton and Okaloosa County. And, and so we, uh, we are funded for those challenges. Mm -hmm. and, and that funding goes to ha having more people in the school and, and more people hands-on. Not necessarily in the classroom. I mean, we've got the same, we get the same classroom funding that all the rest of them do. And we 
we know we have to meet the class size for them, and, and, and we do that. So we have the teachers just like they do. But we have more challenges because of the challenging student population that we have. Uh, I mean, it is, it is top-heavy with uh, serious uh, family issues and challenges in those schools. We have 20 Title I elementary schools. I mean, 20. Right. Uh, I mean, in 2008, we had eight. <laughs> Has the economy in Bay County just gotten worse, or is it? You know, there's, a, there's a combination of factors, and, and look, people... People always accuse me of beating up charter schools. There's, and, and I wrote an editorial um, uh, years ago about choice, choices have consequences. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I want to say that I think every parent has the right to choose where their child goes to school with the exception if the school's overcrowded, you obviously can't put more kids in there than they mm -hmm. can hold capacity-wise. But when you take all of the students that's, that parents are involved, Mm -hmm. and you take them and put them all in one school and you pull them out of other schools and you pull the resources that those parents can bring to those schools and you put them all in one school or a couple schools, those, those schools are going to suffer from losing all that. I mean, when I, when I was in school, uh, all my friends uh, had two parents in the home. They were all middle class. Mm -hmm. And so it made me want to be like them because my mom was raising three boys by herself and we were living in the projects. But the people in my class weren't like me. I was... I wanted to be like everybody else in the class, but now it's flipped. Mm -hmm. If uh, th there, We have some schools that I'd be willing to bet you if there are two students in that class that live with mom and dad, it, it's, it's an oddity. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not bragging about that. I'm just stating the facts. And anybody that wants to disagree with me can certainly disagree with me. They can post whatever they want to post. But the, but the bottom line is that's what our teachers are dealing with daily, the challenges of that and, and the challenges of choice. There are consequences to that. And so when you have those consequences, you need more help in those schools. And it's not that you need more teachers. You need more interventions. You need more uh, guidance counselors. You need more uh, behavior specialists. You need more parent liaisons. You need more social workers. You need all these things. Um, bed bugs. <laughs> this is an issue I don't want to deal with, deal but with, we right? have to deal with it. I mean, we literally had a school year before last that, that gave the student a shower every day and changed his clothes every day mm -hmm. uh, because he came to school like that. And his mother refused to, to do anything about it. Finally, DCF stepped in and, and did something. But, you know, people don't believe these kind of things. They think I'm just making it. I'm not making it up. I mean, uh, you know, I want this millage to pass, but I'm not going to lie to get it passed. Right. The, uh, the, the, the advantage of a millage like this is if they want to know the truth, we'll tell them the truth. They might not like the truth. They might not agree with it. You brought up timing. Timing isn't good. Again, somebody tell me when the right time is. I will make a motion to the board to pull it and with all confidence say, I've been told this date it will pass. Here's when we need to do it. But you know as well as I do, that's not the way it's going to happen. Sure. Um, you know, you were talking about charter schools, and I, and I think the point you're making, and I just want to make sure that, that I understand and people understand, is that in a lot of cases, the public schools lose students who, have, who are more stable, who have parents who are more involved. Those parents take their kids to a charter school, and the public school is left with students uh, mostly whose parents are not involved and who are not as stable. Is that accurate? Well, and, and, and I'm not knocking his parents, and, don't, and, and I know you're not trying to trust my words. It, no. it's, it's accurate to a point, and what I mean by that is they might not be able to. They might work two jobs and might, might not be able to participate mm -hmm. and, and help the student. But the, the stability of the home life is more troubling by far in our Title I schools than in any of the other charter schools. And, and the stability, look, we know abuse goes on in, in all different kinds of family homes. It, it's black, white, rich, poor, it doesn't make any difference. Abuse is abuse and it's terrible and it happens. But we know percentage-wise and statistically, it's more likely going to happen in the students we deal with. Mm -hmm. Our students have very serious needs that we're constantly trying to help and trying to uh, pick up on ways to get into their homes and help their families. That's why we have a social worker. The social worker isn't there as much for the student as it is there for the family to help them with the needs they have because we know if we can help the family become more stable, this kid's going to have a better life. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So there's a tie there that most people don't understand. That's why we have so many social workers in the system now, because we can see the needs of the child will be met if we can help stabilize the family. Now, people say, well, school shouldn't do that. Yeah, well, you know, who else is going to do it if we don't do it? Sure. I mean, that's, that's the world we live in. And so it, it, would all of us like to have a perfect world and not have any of these challenges or problems and have kids all be happy and, and, and wonderful homes? Yes, we'd love it, but that's not the real world we're living in. Yeah. Um, we, we jumped around a little bit, and um, we talked about using the uh, proposed military increase uh, for salaries. But there are some other things that I, I've mm -hmm. seen that you guys want to do. And, and you know, mental health, um, I guess facing the challenges that you have in these Title I schools is among them. Tell me specifically how much money and where. I mean, wh what are we well, going to do? Well, first of all, the mental health challenges aren't just with Title I schools. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. I mean, they're in all of our schools. I mean, they're in the non-Title I schools. They're in middle schools, high schools. They're all over the place. And a lot of it has to do with the pandemic and still the hurricane. We have a lot of students that are still technically homeless because of the hurricane. Now, the definition of a homeless student means they're basically couch surfing. They don't have their own address. They just move from one place to another. But, for example, right now, in, in health, uh, our mental health cost, we are spending um, $5.7 million dollars right now on all these these people now I told you this is grant funded right now but that grant funding is only going to go through about half of next year so how are we going to continue the efforts we know that are working and keeping kids from getting suspended and keeping them from getting Baker acted how are we going to do that and so one of the things we want to do is use some of this to fund those mental health programs and wellness programs we know are benefiting our students we've got the the documentation to prove that it's working and it's effective. So that's one area. The other area are, is safety and security. Right. Uh, we spend um, 2.965, almost $3 million on safety and security. I'd say 95% of that is mandated by the state that we have to do that. Uh, and I've got to come back to one of the findings about this too. Okay. But um, so almost $3 million that we spend on safety and security. And that we are spending $1.1 million more on safety and security than the state funds us. Mm -hmm. But we can't stop doing it. We have to do it. Uh, transportation. The state funds 40% of our transportation costs. 60% aren't funded. And again, all that comes off the top. So these are all things that have to be paid so off the top. So what would you do on safety and security? Would you hire more people? Would well, no, we would just continue to continue what you're doing. Continue what we're doing. Yeah, okay. we don't have a choice. We'd have to we'd have to cut teachers for anything else. But here's one of the findings, and this is the irony of the thing. And it comes back to charter schools. And again, I'm not mad at charter schools, but the law is crazy. I'm responsible for making sure that every charter school has an officer in their school every day. Were you surprised when you learned that? Yeah. I met with them because I saw the law. You I call met them with every day? You call them? Oh, no, call that's just it. Now I'm going to have to figure out how to do it. <laughs> I mean, I, do I hire somebody and go around and take a picture to verify they're there? Right. I, I mean, but that's, that's the kind of findings. This is what accountants do. The auditors do. They go in and they find these things. And I said, well, tell me how to do it. So we can't tell you how to do it. You just need to do it. Okay. <laughs> fly a drone over there every day, I guess, and take pictures. They said they couldn't tell you how to do no. it. No. And, and, and so, so that's extremely frustrating. But the, but the, the point in, in that is that we have to do these things. We don't have a choice. These are things that have to be done. So if we're going to have to, if we're going to continue to do these things, and look, I'm all about safety and security. I, sure. I tell everybody that's 1A and 1B. Well, the guy shot at you once. Well, so I'm, not, I'm more worried about the students than I am me. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying that flippantly. I, I mean that. Yeah. I mean, I'm worried about the, the well-being of the students. So we have got to make sure that, that we continue to do what's required by law, but it's not cheap to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you... Are you doing everything you can, you feel like, to keep those schools safe? Oh, yes. I mean, that's why we're spending $1.1 1 uh, 1 .1 million more than what we're being funded. Sure. I mean, if there was anything else, I mean, we have added more cameras, more fencing. Uh, you know, we have someone monitoring the cameras 24-7. Have you ever been to our, our safety office? Oh, yeah. You've seen, all, I mean, the new yeah. one at, well, I at Springfield? So. Yeah, I th well, I mean, I, I mean, know you, I have, you think I have this office is swank? This is nothing. 
<laughs> and what I mean by that is those camera systems that they can pull up and they can see something and they can call the school right away and say, look, here's something going on. You need to go find out what it is. Is that a, is that a problem you guys face routinely that you have that? I don't think it's a problem. I think it's an advantage. Okay. I mean, I think it's an advantage that we. Well, I, I don't. I mean that people are either trying to get on campus or people are there. No, no. There. I, I, I. You know what no, I mean? No, it's concerning when someone's trying to get on campus or an office is having a problem or two kids are fighting in the courtyard and nobody's there or something like mm -hmm. that. But I mean, that's again, that's just the extra eyes we have now because we have so many cameras everywhere. And Mike Jones, Chief Jones, has done an amazing job putting all this together. But I would tell you what he'd say. He's got a great team. And uh, Lee Walters works with him in placing these, and we're constantly adding more and more cameras and more and more security. We have four cameras on every school bus. Now, and we're not putting them on there to catch the kids doing something bad. We're putting them on there to verify what's supposed to be happening on there. And if a parent says, somebody did this to my kid, we can go right away and find out and say, well, let me tell you the rest of the story, and here's what actually happened. Sure. Or, yeah, you're right, and we're going to get that kid that did this to your child. So, I mean, the, yeah. the, the security cameras are there for a purpose, and the purpose is school safety and security. It's not a I got you thing. We're sure. not using it to be big brother. We're using it to protect everyone. Well, and, and I find, you know, when I've done stories about cameras, what you find out is that a lot of times the person in authority didn't do the thing they're accused of, and now I have it on, you know, video that the bus driver didn't actually do that or did do it. But regardless, you know, I can look on the camera and see, right? Has that been your experience? Well, the, the, ca the few times I've been involved with camera, it's usually a... a somebody calling and saying that a student threw a bottle out the bus window. Oh, really? That's, that's the uh, problem? You know, and, yeah. I, I, you know, the fights, I mean, the administrators used to deal with, if there's a fight, they can get the video like that. There's no use of me getting involved. It's mm -hmm. black or white. They can see it. I don't sure. need to get involved. Usually what happens to me is it's not a parent. It's a community or, or citizen that mm -hmm. saw something being thrown out the window and wants us to do something about it. So they tell me about where they were and what time it was, and we, we know where every bus is every minute. They're all tracked. What's the, what's the punishment for throwing something out the window? Uh, I'm pretty sure they get in trouble. <laughs> All right, one other thing you want to, I think you, you guys have talked to your office that uh, the district is looking at with the millage increase is a pre-K program. So what, what are you guys doing there and why? We already have pre-K programs across the district. What we want to do is offer the, uh, the families that can't afford it an extended day at no cost. We know the studies have proven that if you can get more students in pre-K, they're going to be much more uh, prepared for kindergarten and much more successful. One of the big issues we have, and our kindergarten teachers will tell you, and I, I hope some of them see this and they can comment or whatever, mm -hmm. but constantly kindergarten teachers are telling us the students that come in there that don't go to pre-K, they don't have the social skills, they're not ready, they don't know the colors, they don't even know how to spell their name. Now, when maybe you were in kindergarten, that wasn't required, but it is now. The mm -hmm. requirements for kindergarten and first and second grade are much more than they've ever been. And so to more prepare those students, we think we could offer those parents, look, you don't have to worry about them only being here a few hours. We'll take them all day. We'll, they'll get free, free uh, breakfast, free lunch. And then if you want them to stay extended day, they can stay there for a nominal fee and we'll even feed them dinner. And so we want to extend that, uh, that offer, and we want to make it an, a, a positive thing because we know the students will be better, and it will be a better thing for the parents. Okay. Um, when you look at your budget, are there any issues that you, um, you think need to change? Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I hear a lot, for whatever reason, has to do with um, advertising spending. I think the district occasionally spends some money sort of advertising itself. Um, you know, are there are there issues there? Are there other issues where you think uh, we need to change the budget or, or have any issues? Well, there are two. Th First of all, to address your advertising question, I think you, you, you have to advertise. I don't think we advertise a, a large amount, but uh, by law, there are some things we have to put in the paper regularly. Mm -hmm. And so we have a contract, and we do that, and we will continue to do that because we don't have any choice. And, yes, we do advertise some. I mean, I, if you don't brag about yourself, I learned this from Dr. Stephanie Gall. She said, if you don't brag about yourself, nobody else will brag about you. And so I believe that that is an important part of what you do. And I think every entity understands that, that you have to do some bragging sometime. And it's, it, it's, it's not a whole lot. But I'll tell you, the two areas, the only two areas where a school district's going to save 
our health insurance and energy cost. We spend approximately $9 million a year on energy and probably $29 million a year. It's probably more now on health insurance. And so we became self-insured a few years ago. The board accepted our plan and they supported it and we're so grateful that when we became self-insured, we are much more efficient with our health insurance. While our health insurance rates have continued to go up a little bit, they're not going up anywhere near as drastically as everyone else is. So, I mean, I consider that a huge savings, but that's something we're always looking at. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is the energy cost. So, uh, Lee Walters with our uh, facilities department is constantly upgrading air conditioning systems. Uh, that's your biggest cost of energy is your HVAC systems. And, and everyone knows we have huge HVAC systems all across the district. And so uh, if you can become more efficient in those areas, that's where you're going to save more money. We are almost 70% personnel. Uh, it, it, that's just a fixed cost. But, but then you've got security and safety issues. You've got transportation issues. you got, I mean, things that just you, you, you can't cut out, things that you have to do that you're required to do, and you can't have business without them. Uh, I mean, we used to call them unfunded mandates, right? Oh, there's a bunch like of those. Well, it's like organized. transportation, 40-60. Mm -hmm. They give us 40% mm -hmm. of what we actually earn in transportation, and but we have to and offer they the say good luck. Yeah, good luck. It hasn't raised in 30 years, I think, the mm -hmm. rate of transportation. Wow. Um, okay, last, last thing, and thank you for, for uh, going through it with us, and I appreciate it. Uh, and and I, I said at the beginning we'd just go however long we went and we did so uh, you know again um, but what do you what do you want voters voters in April are going to walk in they're going to vote on this thing they're essentially voting uh, a tax on themselves I mean that's that's what it boils down to if you're a property owner you, you rent you're going to face this probably what do you want them to think about when they make that vote well if they're uh, um if they're a business owner or a company owner, think about the customers that you have because of them. We're the largest employer in Bay County. I think that uh, a rising tide raises all ships. I think that they want what's best for children or for students, and I think they realize the job that we have done. You look around this country right now. Look at Chicago, New York, Washington, D.C., Baltimore. Are there kids in school? No. Our kids are in school, been in school since August, and I'm proud of that. And, and it doesn't mean it hasn't been difficult. I hate the quarantining that we're doing, but we're following the CDC guidelines. Uh, but, I, I mean, for the most part, I get people stop me all the time and thank you for keeping the schools open. Thank you that I can go to work. Thank you for, uh, you know, the, the, the passion that your teachers are working so hard and doing everything. And that's what I want them to think about when they go to the polls. Think about that. Think about the jobs that we actually are doing. Uh, and, and so I, I, I'm so proud of our teachers and support personnel. I mean, everyone from bus drivers, maintenance, to the paraprofessionals in the classroom, the confidential secretaries, all of them, they work so hard to do everything. And think about those people. They're the customers that come to your business. They're the patients that come to your office. They're the ones we're talking about. All right. Mr. Superintendent, I appreciate your time. Thank you again. Thank you guys for watching. Thanks, Hope everybody Brady. has a good day.